It's another Spike Studio production. Welcome everybody. Join myself as I talk about deploying plugins and widgets using the catalog as well as site updates into your Lotus Notes and same time environment. The security, the architecture, the basics of what they both are, and actually what the components are inside of a plugin itself or a feature as we call it. Don't forget to visit our sponsor for this one, Plantronics, at bit.ly slash I do Plantronics too. One thing I wanted to point out um, on this screen is before we get started is the mailing list is growing and the webcasts are starting to grow and the requests are starting to grow. So if you don't actually subscribe, I suggest you do so. Uh, we're trimming up a little bit of the list for those that just pop in and out, but you can actually subscribe to just the consultant in your pocket stuff, the I do note stuff, um, or all of them overall across all the podcasts and webcasts that are going on. But it'll let you know about the upcoming events as they happen. So this is a big one. This one has a lot of material to cover. Uh, actually, there's going to be a whole bunch of things that we need to do on this one. I'm going to change screens over real quick and bring up the presentation. Everyone should be seeing that now. If you're not, please raise your hand and let me know. But otherwise, this one's going to be about deploying plugins and widgets for Lotus Notes and same time. We're not going to talk about actually building a plugin from the development core perspective, but the architecture behind how you get them to the users, what the catalogs are, how it all fits together. That's going to be the focus of it today. Uh, please ask questions as we go along. If you have one, I'll be glad to see it. Um, I can see them in the question area. And let me see if there's one in here. And yes, this one is being recorded, so you will be able to watch it later as well. So that one will be online and ready for you to watch again later. That doesn't mean you can leave now. That just means it will be around later for you guys to watch. So not a problem at all. All right, let's get started really quick. So we already talked about who it's brought to you by, but the biggest part, real quick, is Plantronics. I want to give you two seconds on them. They're not here to actually present themselves. I'm doing it all for them. They have released a plugin that goes into your Lotus Notes or Same Time Connect client. It's free. Um, you can get it from that URL on your screen there. It'll take you right to the page in the middle of the download. You can use, of course, the VOIP stuff without with their headsets, without the plugin, but what it gives you is call control. So they built a plugin that embeds itself into the client and gives you call control so the headset that you're on, you can actually answer calls, you can change lines, you can do a whole bunch of other features, put it on hold. So they did that one, and Plantronics was kind enough to actually sponsor this one and offer a couple headsets. Uh, some of you may have seen, they said, do you want to be part of their trial and their beta and you know look at their call system stuff that they do for the headsets? If they asked it and they offer it to you, I would jump on it if you can. So there's two of them I use now. I'm actually using the one on the right to do the webcast itself. So uh, that is the office control. If you look at the one on the right, what I like about it for all of you geeks like me is if you look carefully at the image, you'll see a green light at the top. The right part goes to your phone, which is what I'm on now using the, you know, the normal phone lines. The left one actually also hooks to your PC via USB. So I can toggle back and forth between Skype calls, phone calls, same time calls. I can put one on hold, switch to the other. I can answer on the headset with their plug-in as I walk around. Uh, it's an amazing piece of technology, uh, the headset itself. And the left one is their UC one. They made it straight for unified communications for users. Uh, I use it when I'm on the road. Carrying the bag, it comes in a little bit tiny pouch, but it plugs in your USB. So it's a 30-foot Bluetooth range, where the one on the right is a, like a 300-foot DEC6 encrypted range. But the one on the left is USB. Plug it in. It supports up to, I believe it's more than five Bluetooth devices on one headset. So it'll work with your computer, with your phones. Um, both of them, you can switch back and forth. It's an awesome piece of technology. So I use that when I'm on the road for same time as well as for the uh, uh, what, uh, Skype and anything else I want to do and listen. So, All right, off we go. So this one's pretty straightforward. It's an exploding market. We're seeing a ton of partners jump in that have never been in the space before. You saw it at Lotusphere. I podcasted some of them. We webcasted some of them. Uh, GIST, uh, Tungle, a bunch of others. There's another podcast coming up in the next couple weeks that actually talks about it. So keep that in mind when we talk about some of the security and deployment in just a minute. It's a big part of what we're going to talk about here. Uh, many of them are development-only shops, so the problem is they don't understand all the deployment possibilities. They're just building a plug-in and throwing it out to you. And I've seen that's become a bigger area and a bigger problem is they're just throwing it out there and hoping uh, that you guys download and install it. The issue is, is 
as an administrator, or even you as a developer, some of you I know are developers, how do I build the plugins for deployment properly that companies can take advantage of? And that's what we're going to talk about today. Not the core part of the development, but how you actually take advantage. So think about environment security, think about architecture, uh, think about desktop controls, what you give your users rights to do. Most of us have the wonderful ability that we're able to do what we want on our machine. We're able to install what we want, we're able to take off things we don't want, we can download programs. Users aren't like that, mainly in some of the large scale environments. They're just not capable, and we don't want them to because we don't trust them. That's probably the biggest part is we don't trust them. So this is the part where we get into the catalogs, the site updates, the whole manipulation and management of the users themselves. So we're going to walk through the, the agenda. I'm going to do some live stuff. We're going to do some work just straight off the slides. We're going to be able to jump back and forth as we need to. Please ask questions as we go. I also have a couple polls that are built in, which I'll be able to send out to everybody. I'm just curious at some of the things you may have done already. So first thing, the basics for both, for plugins and widgets, uh, basically how it fits into the architecture. Uh, we can talk about the basic of how a couple of them were built and how they're uh, formed when they're put into the servers themselves. Security and policy controls will be another big part. And then we'll talk about deployment architecture and what sort of things that you need to consider as you get ready to roll this out to your users. This is a big part of it when we get into where everybody fits together in the deployment architecture itself. That's pretty much a huge portion of what we got to deal with as we go through. So let's talk about the plugin basics first. This is how you define a plugin. Lotus kind of uses a name that doesn't really fit. They use it multiple ways, multiple times, and it doesn't really fit what you need to understand when you're talking about it with customers, in terms of your company, uh, to other partners when you're trying to develop. A plugin itself is actually just a piece of the puzzle. Lotus uses that as a term that you put into your client. In the Notes A client, it's not actually a plugin. You're deploying a set of features. So the Eclipse framework starting in the standard 8.0 is a picture frame around the old basic notes client is what it is. You're never really manipulating the basic client. You're manipulating the frame, the picture frame around it, right? You have the new sidebars. You have the new menu across the top, the new open button you know, that drops down your menus. That's the picture frame. So you're changing the feature set of how the picture frame works. They use the word plugin. Plugins are a piece of features, and I'm going to show you the diagram in just a minute to show you how it all really fits together. You can use portions of plugins over and over inside of features. So this is where all the terminology gets confusing, but the pictures I'm going to show you, and you'll be able to download the slides later, so no one has to ask. We'll actually break it down a little easier so you'll understand how it really fits together based upon the Eclipse terminology and framework this is based on. Plugins can be downloaded and installed in both, same time and notes. They change the look and feel, but keep in mind the other way it affects the clients differently between Lotus Notes and the same time is we call it a plugin for both. But really in Notes, it's a shelf application, right? Also, it sits on the side. It sits on the side shelf. We're not talking widgets. We're talking plugins. They're a little bit different. A widget can interact with text. A plugin can change the look and feel. That's the big difference. Some partners are saying they're giving you a widget when they're really giving you a plug-in. And we're going to talk about that. That's a major thing to keep in mind also, the way all this fits together. So it sounds confusing up front, but I'll make it really easy. We're going to draw pictures. We're going to do everything you need to know. Uh, plugins are now a core part of not only the same time client, but also the notes client. A lot of you have peeked at the Eclipse framework underneath, and you'll see there is tons of what they'll call plugins underneath. That is a true plug-in. They're pieces that can be reused and then redeployed inside of features. So really what you're giving users is new features. So let's talk about a picture. If I can draw you the simplest term I possibly can. I had one that was a little more descriptive, but I went to the second level instead of like a developer level. We went to the second one. So what you start with is a plugin directory. This plugin directory is where you're going to store all the loose pieces of things that you want to give to users. Like I gave it different names with the version number. So this is just be plug W. We've got an X, a Y, and a Z. So what you're going to get is four different plugins. Now these plugins mean nothing to a client unless something refers to them. And that's the big part of the puzzle. The way the Notes client is designed is you can put multiple loose plugins on the file system. And unless you tell them that they're there and how to use them inside a feature, the Notes client 
pretty much doesn't know what to do with them. It needs some sort of descriptor that's built around it. The same with the same time connect client. It needs the descriptors built around it. The descriptors around it are actually called features. Now if you look at the way this is drawn out is I'm deploying a feature. The feature can call the same parts of multiple plugins. I could actually interchange the arrows down below. Whatever I want to do. This is what changes the look and feel. This is how the notes client sees and the same time client sees what it needs to do with a plugin. Right? It actually deploys a feature. So if that's clear to everybody, I hope, is a plugin is a term that Lotus uses heavily, but it's not the true thing of what you're actually giving the user. You're actually giving them pieces of plugins and deploying them a new feature. Okay? Because the feature is what gets updated later on we'll talk about. I know it all sounds confusing. I actually keep breaking it down for you as we go along. And I spent, some of you probably know, it's been a few years of you know, going through this more and more, deploying these, building site updates for companies, talking everything we can about it. And it still becomes a confusing factor in the way they blended it together. And I'm going to tell you the pros and cons of some of the ways they've done it as we go along. So the feature changes the client. If you notice that versioning is a major part of everything we talk about from here on out, versioning numbers. So the example I gave you was a 1.0 on the left. Later on, well, of course, you're going to want to deploy a 101 to the users. Multiple features can use portions of plugins over and over, but the idea is they usually enhance what was already there. They may give you a new plugin piece for the feature. They may add additional capabilities. They may call an additional plugin that they never used before in the feature. The version number tells the client what the most current thing available to them is. So a feature has a version number. A plugin has a version number. The feature will describe which plugin it needs and which version number it needs. The client will always attempt, by default, to look for the most recent thing it can based upon the deployment architecture you pick later on. So the client naturally wants to update itself. It naturally wants to give, get the most recent thing. All right, we're still in plugins. We're not in widgets yet. That's what it wants to do with those. So what I'm curious is, is that how many of you have actually downloaded any plugins from third party? I'm very curious how many of you have actually done that. Um, one of the things I think we need to do is take a peek at that. So I see a bunch of you are answering. I'll give you another quick second to uh, take a look. Now keep in mind, plugins themselves are ones that are changing the look and feel of the client in Notes and adding functionality to same time itself. And it can change the look and feel too. It can change branding. It can change a whole bunch of the parts inside of it. So we'll go ahead and close this up. All right. Now I can share it if you want so everyone can see it. So there you get a good idea. All right. The idea is that most of you have downloaded a plugin from somewhere. It could be from Lotus. It could be from a partner. A few of you haven't gotten into it. For the rest of you, you're considering it. And you need to understand the implications of why you're doing it, why you're here, which is a good spread. So we get a little, you know, a good overlay of everybody across the board. That's really a good spread for everybody. All right, so let's get back inside. And almost all of you voted. I'm, a, I'm, I'm pleased most of you are paying attention today. I really am. We'll just go with that factor right from the start. So now let's talk about the difference with widgets. And then we'll talk about how widgets and plugins work together. If anyone's not confused, you're on the right path. So keep that in mind as a layout. Plugins pull features that change the look and feel. All right? They can call other plugins underneath, but the whole thing layers into what is called a feature. Lotus uses the term plugin too much. Um, it doesn't really fit the model of the way the framework's built. And that's one of the most confusing parts for all of you to understand. Um, you can use the term if you want, and you can use it to plug in if you want, but really it's a feature. All right, the feature then calls the pieces underneath. So then what is a widget? And then we'll do some live stuff too. A widget itself, we had to do the basics first. A widget is a drag and drop. It's cool, it's on the fly. I can create them on the fly if I'm given the rights. I can install them on the fly if I'm given the rights. Notice the key thing is given the rights. We talk about that during security. Widgets you don't use over and over. They're a standalone item. They're built inside uh, someone's dream world of a form, a web form. Uh, they may be looking up things across documents and databases. They may have a separate view. It may be a web view. But a widget is a simple 
on-the-fly approach to deploying some cool functionality. Right? It's not a plug-in. You're not actually changing the look and feel of the Notes client with a widget. You may be able to click text inside of an email message, which we'll show in just a second, and items like that, but you're not actually changing the look and feel of the frame. So you're not adding features to it. If you drag a widget over to your sidebar and it changes the look and feel of your client, that widget is technically calling out to a plugin. So it's not really a widget at that point anymore. It's a plugin. It's actually calling out and saying, hey, they've drug over the widget. Go out to the web or go to my update site or wherever this is, and we're going to talk about the options, and get me that plugin or that feature. Then that feature comes and installs, and it changes the look and feel of your client. So that's where they kind of cheat you a little bit in the wording. A lot of times we'll say, here's our new widget. It's not a widget. It's a front-end call to go out and get a plugin itself. Widgets have their own controls. They have their own policy settings than plugins do. The way they're updated, the way they're pulled, the way they're put into the client, totally separate from plugins. But they can call plugins. So widgets have that capability to do so. So you're able to use the widget catalog. And this is where Lotus got around it a little bit. And we're going to talk about that during deployment, is using widgets to call plugins. Okay. So that's how we define a widget. All of the thing for widgets different than plugins is that widgets are based around the catalog itself. The catalog has categories inside of it. Administrators can force installations, which we'll talk about during deployment. It gives you a lot of flexibility. It's a very cool way for you guys to control what the users get. Now, what I'm showing you on this one is actually a public widget catalog. We're going to talk about where it is and how to get to it. But it's a public catalog. So if you don't have any widgets built now or you're not sure what you want to test, there is some public places to go that are available that you can actually grab from the catalog. Lotus has one on the web, and this one's on the web. This one can also be replicated. So there's different ways you can work with this. The idea is, is you're able to categorize, sort, force users, not force users, give them options of what they want to do. It gives you flexibility and control of your environment in dealing with the users and what they want to do. So one thing about the widget catalog as a developer and as an administrator, never change the defaults that are there. So do not remove any views. Do not try to change the extension.xml, which we'll talk about. Don't try to change anything at all that's already there. You can add to it, though. You can build in workflow. You can set the ACL. You can add additional views. But do not change what is already there when dealing with the catalog. Take that to heart. And that's actually documented. Um, out there for you to read. They're telling you do not mess with the defaults inside the catalog, kind of like the address book that a lot of people have messed with over the years. The idea is for you not to mess around with the defaults that are there, but to expand it and extend it as best you can. So let's take a look at some of the things that you can and can't do. And we'll go live here in a second. So the catalog itself has documents inside of it. They all show as extension.xml files. Uh, anywhere in the catalog is drag and drop if allowed. Some of them can be emailed if allowed. It's an effective way for you to manage your environment. So when we move here in a second into deployment and security, it'll all start making a little more sense. But the idea is you can actually take screenshots. And I will tell you the one that's on the screen is publicly available. And it's probably one of the most addictive games you'll ever put inside your client. And it's also so simple. But I put it out there for you. You'll be able to get it. The idea is that you can give a descriptor to users that they can see a you know sample picture. They can drag it across. You can put whatever description you want inside of it. And it gives people like a browse ability and a browse catalog ability. Now here's the downfall to this. In this manner of what you're seeing on the screen for you now, I'm presuming that I'm allowing my users to be able to install widgets themselves. So in this manner right here, I'm telling them, I wish for you to be able to grab these and drag them in and put them into your client yourself. So the security has been modified a little bit in what the user can do. We're going to talk about that during security considerations and actually look at that stuff live. It's a good way to change it. Now we have a choice. If I can talk about and show a couple samples the way plugins work now, and then we can dig through them and uh, widgets, or we can actually go through the security. I'm thinking I'm going to go ahead and show you some live stuff first, because it would probably make the most sense. And then we'll get back inside of it. Okay. So give me a brief moment. And I'm going to bring it back to myself. 
Okay, so you guys should be able to come back and see my desktop itself. Excellent. So we'll log into a client and we'll bring the client up. So in two seconds you should see the client. There you go. So here's the good part. What you're able to see here is I scooted around a little bit so I can see what's going on myself to make sure you guys don't have questions. So what you're seeing is me slide to the left only so I can make sure you guys don't have questions. That big blank right side spot there is uh, so I can see the menus to make sure you guys don't have anything uh, held up in the air and any questions from anybody going on. All right, so here's what we have. We have the actual side over here. We have plugins and widgets and all sorts of things going on across the top. What I'm showing you, everything here is free. You're able to do these on your own. But I want to show you how widgets actually perform and plugins actually perform. It's a big part of how all this works. Uh, the top one is a freely available one from Julian, Julian Robichow. Julian has a widget called Recon that's publicly available that I put in. Actually, what I have for you guys also is a blog post going up later today with my top 10 widgets that I use all the time between my clients. So you'll be able to click and get to all these. This is one of the ones I give you. For an administrator, even developers with write, I'm able to pick a server, type in a simple command, and send it right from the site. So what you guys are able to see is the ability of this whole thing, and it's scrollable, of course. So I'm able to issue server commands right from a widget on the site. And how did I get the widget? I strictly just drug it into my sidebar and installed it is all I did. I have it set in its own window right now. Now let me show you a couple things they changed about the UI starting starting in the 8.5 code streams that was different in the 8.0 code stream. Previously, when I installed a widget, and we'll get to installing one, but when I installed a widget previously, it would actually, I'd double click it, and it would go ahead and it would open itself right here in the sidebar. Now they've made the default according to user request, all right, open in its own window. Now, one thing you guys didn't get to see is when I opened up this one right here, it actually put a username and password into the document because it's a web form to open that up. And we'll talk about the security around that in a few minutes. So you're actually storing username and passwords for web forms inside of widgets that are in your sidebar. So the, what they changed was if you want one to open in the sidebar anymore, you actually have to right click and open it as a sidebar panel. By default, you're going to get a new window. That's the default that they offer you now from inside of Lotus. They changed that. But previously, it was sidebar, and now it's new window. And that's a change that they made starting in the 8.5 code stream. So keep that in mind for users. That's the default they get. The other thing is the window sizing itself. Some people want widgets to take up the full screen. What they've also given you is the ability to, once they open the widget, if they make it full screen, it'll keep that in memory. So the next time they open it, it'll stay the same. That wasn't in the lower 8.0x code stream. They've added that later on. So what we have is a couple. So we'll close up some of these widgets up for you. We have a Lotus Learning widget that was installed that some of you may have seen already. It actually goes out and pulls plugin information, which is a little different. So you're getting all sorts of different capabilities built inside the products now with these side widgets. And I'm not going to give you the basics of you know, cool widgets and things like that. I'll put them in the blog post later. The idea is I'm giving you is notice that these do not change the look and feel of the client. They're not features. Widgets are not features. They're not changing the way that the client looks and feels. They're not adding menu bars and toolbars and other cool things like that. That's a major difference between widgets and plugins. Right? Plugins, look and feel, features. Widgets, strictly handling sidebar interaction inside of it. Okay? Let's take a look at another one. Another part you guys are able to do is if I go inside, and this is a cool one, is work with live text. So as you see, I'm giving you guys live information. So working with live text, based upon the way I have widgets installed, and I have one right here for Lotus Software Knowledge Base, I'm able to come in, and let's just scroll down to find some text. Replicator page. If I was having trouble as an administrator, and I'm giving you the idea now of how a widget interacts with live text. We're not talking about building them right now, just how it interacts for your users, is I'm able to actually click and take those words and search Lotus Support on the fly. Because live text is available to find documents that should be underlined, as well as the ability for me to highlight words and then interact with a widget. So 
So widgets can actually interact with documents by live text, which will recognize things like addresses, phone numbers, URLs for web conferencing, so a whole bunch of those. Or I can highlight text and interact with a widget. Once again, it's not a plug-in, not changing look and feel. The widget's providing an interaction with the text. Because if I actually only launch the basic client, that text is identical and exactly the same. There's no interaction because there's no widget. Right, so basic mode has the same text, just no widget. The idea is that this is giving me capability. Right? So let's talk about the widget catalog a little bit. And I'll move the client over so you can see it all. Does anyone have any questions this part so far? And while we're sitting here, I had uh, one more poll. I'm curious, how many of you have a widget catalog built? This is a major part. Wow. There you go. Everybody's voted that's in here. Wait till you see the stats on this one, guys. Let me go ahead and uh, share that to you. A widget catalog is a mainstay of how all this functions. If you're doing this on your own ad hoc and you're deploying widgets on your own or letting users do it on your own, there's a couple pieces you need to be aware of. Some of the security concerns, which we're going to talk about and get into in just a minute, as well as control, as well as updating. Uh, there's a whole bunch of areas. A widget catalog is a, is a very core part of how all this functions and fits together. So we're going to look at site update databases as well as widget catalogs in the next few minutes and jump back and forth between live stuff and the uh, slides to describe how it works together. All right. That's a big deal, is all you saw. That's a really big deal and how it fits together. So let me do this. Let me go back and get you guys back to the slides real quick. You get an idea of what we got to talk about here. That's an interesting, interesting stat to me, honestly. Um, only because of the way it was handled before. So there we go. Everyone seen it again? All right. Excellent. It's an interesting stat to me that you guys did that and the way you handled it in terms of deploying it because the catalog is a mainstay. And a lot of you then are deploying widgets on your own without actually having a catalog that's built behind it. So a current issue before we move on to actual deployment stuff. The My Widget sidebar in starting in 851, it's been SPR now, has an issue with sometimes you are trying to act on how I selected text with one widget but it's actually working off another widget, and they know about it, and it's been SPR'd. But a way to get yourself back to working mode properly is to hide and unhide the sidebar panel using the view menu. So view, show, your different sidebars. It'll get you reset back to where you need to be. It won't affect the widgets. So you won't have to do anything extra. You just have to hide and unhide that sidebar temporarily. Uh, became a problem where you would click on certain words and think you're going to look at support, but you'll end up pulling up a tracking system or it's just some way that they had the uh, text recognizers working inside of it. Just a side note for you that's a current issue. So let's talk about security and policy. Um, this is a mainstay of the presentation, meaning this is probably the area that I want you to focus with first, but I had to start at the basics of underlying the differences between them so you understood how security works. When you build out the deployable architecture, security is your main concern. And I'm going to describe to you why it's a main concern and how it all fits together and where the policies are for it. Um, if you have questions, this is definitely the time uh, to let me know about those as we go along. All right. So user self-provisioning control. I never want my users, before I even show you, I don't want my users doing anything. I want to control their every move as best I can. I don't want to allow my users to be able to install their own plugin. We're going back in the same order, plugins and widgets. I don't want my users to do their own plugin. There's a huge security risk involved in this if I let them do their own, as well as I have to give them rights to manipulate the look and feel of their client. Because technically, they could be installing a NASCAR plugin. They could be installing the hot calendar of the week, right? Doesn't matter. They could be installing their favorite cat pose of the day. You know, they could be looking at goats. It doesn't really matter what they're doing. They can change the look and feel of their client with plugins. You have the ability to either allow or disallow them to do this. Now, there's a couple places this is all put together, and this is where it's confusing. The way they handled 
plugins and provisioning for updating, one is in an expected place and one is a very unexpected place. And I've gone round and round. I've expressed in blogs and others my confusion over this, but it hasn't been there. So inside the desktop settings policy, there's one little box under provisioning. So if you look and see, on the basics, provisioning, allow user-initiated updates enable or disable. What this gives you is a menu inside of your client. So for all of you that go and use your open button and then go under application, there's an install ability where you'll be able to install applications. Those are actual features. You're installing features. You're able to go out and look for new features to install. And that's a killer to me is how they use the word plugin is because when you go out there, the darn box pops up and says, do you want me to look for new features to install? It's asking you the word features too. This is giving the user the ability to let you control it or let them have the ability to also install their own. I would take the stance for most larger organizations, mid-size to larger, if you're small and the users have pretty much a free will now on their desktop, don't take it away. You may want to let them do some stuff. But if you're mid to larger, you want to control their every move so you have less support anxieties later on, leave this disabled. You will want them not to be able to do it. So what you'll be able to stop them do, stop them from doing is going out and grabbing plugins on their own. Those menus have vanished. Now, previously, in the early 8x code, if you're in the early 8x code, like 80, 801, there's some hacks on the web. They're not hacks that allow you to go and turn on a true statement inside of their any that will let them get this menu back. The policy will override that now. But early on, you can actually go in and override that ability. This also stands true on same time. You were able to do that in the 7.5 code stream of same time. You were able to go in and override the ability that the administrator gave you just by going to the web and learning the any line. Heck, I even put it in a newsletter for sysadmin tips. So you were able to actually go in and just say, oh, yeah, com IBM, and then you set the whole variable equals true and restart your client, and voila, I now have a menu that said install. That's now moved to great policy control. If the policy says disable, then the user won't see the menu. Okay. So when we were testing the Plantronics stuff, the actual plugins for that, I had to go in and create a quick explicit policy for a few users. They can install it on their own. And that gets into packaging we talk about in a few minutes, but they needed to install it on their own. So I had to give them the ability to an explicit policy because they weren't able to unhide that menu option. Okay. So now signatures. Now really put your, put your thinking caps on and we need to talk about this. This gets into the mode of do I trust who signed the feature, the plugins inside the feature? Do I trust who that is? Because if you give these people trust, they're able to change the look and feel of your client. These fields inside the security policy document, so keep in mind, user's ability, desktop settings, the administrator control, security settings of what they do on their desktop. Right, this has the passwords, ECLs. But this only controls the type of plugin to allow, and I'm telling you, beware of unsigned plugins. You are pretty much giving rights for a plugin to access data, sometimes file system, uh, could be accessing location documents, could be accessing mail information. Beware of where your plugin comes from and how it reacts and what it does. Install it on a test machine first and see what it does. See if it's opening connections. See if it's pulling data or sending data. See where it's going. But you can actually prompt the user. Always trust IBM, which is by default, as you see. Trust IBM for signing. Or what do I do if it's not signed by somebody I know? Do I block it? Do I, add? I never want to ask the user. But the defaults are ask the user. I never want to ask the user anything because you know what kind of answers you're going to get back. So the idea is to restrict this as best you can. Be very cautious if a company is not issuing you signed plug-in sets that are part of a feature. Right? I'm trying to get you to learn the, learn the terminology. So if they don't give you signed plug-in parts, so remember, those small parts underneath that build a feature, those need to be digitally signed, and you need to be able to verify that signature. And what do you want to do with them if the signature is invalid or it expired or if it's not signed at all? We're not going to ask the user. We're going to deny the installation. That's, that would be my first goal, deny the installation, mainly if it's not signed. If you want to do anything at all, 
go with unsigned, don't install. But if they're expired or whatever, eh, that's up to you. Okay. Always for IBM, pretty much works across the board. Now, same time is in a whole different different place to update. Same time, you need to push them down to the user. You don't want them installing them themselves. You want to give them the right to do it, which, as you see in the screen I give you, this is part of same time policies. Right? You have a checkbox for allowing plugin installation and two URLs of where to go to get them. We haven't. We're just getting ready to move into that with deployment as soon as we finish security. But in same time you tell the user where to go get their updates from with a URL. And we're going to talk about what makes up that URL in just a minute. So don't get ahead of yourself. We're going to talk about how that fits together. Widgets come from a catalog. Plugins can be called from a widget or can be called from a URL. Confusion, I know. Confusion abound. So learn the proper verbiage. Features can be called from a widget or from a URL. And at the same time, they'll call them plugins, but they are actually features as well, are called from a URL only. There is no catalog. Right? You're actually, the catalog is the URL. And the URL is an update site. So what you're giving them is an update site. And all this, I'm going to bring it together in just a minute, because there's two places you're going to end up going by default. This is the actual screen for where you get widgets. Widgets are controlled also inside of both for security and for deployment. And understanding all these settings is something we're going to look at in just a minute live, but understanding all these and what you can do. So inside of the widget control, I can force a user to get stuff. I can allow them to do stuff. Actually, we can talk about it live because the screenshot's pretty good. I was looking at it first. So first things first, the catalog server. The catalog server is where the user will go to find the widget catalog. For a plugin and feature, they look for a URL. For a widget, they look for a notes server. Database, NSF. It's built upon the widget catalog template. You can give it whatever name you want. You can call it tool set. You can call it widget catalog. You can call it whatever you want to call it. But they're looking for a notes server, and they're looking for a database NSF name in these fields. This is what the user will then get to configure them. It's a beautiful thing. You're telling the user what it will be. From there, you're going to move into existing catalog entries and categories to install. So what you can do is make a category inside of the widget catalog. You could call it business. You could call it enforced. You could call it mandatory. You can call it whatever you want. It doesn't matter. The users will get all of those if you put that category name in that field. So you're able to force users to get certain categories. Now, here's what's so cool about this. You're able to give the user the ability, based upon all these settings, to force them to get certain widgets. So maybe you have a tracking program. Maybe you have a, a FedEx thing. Maybe you have one for looking at your internal portal for daily updates or something. Whatever it is, the widget can do anything. Right? That's development. That's a whole different uh, seminar we're going to do. The idea is, though, is you can force them which ones they do get and then say, you know what? We're going to allow you to browse the catalog and maybe pick your own fun things or tools you may want to do for your job. All right. So the field below we jump down to is live text. What that gives them is the ability inside of a document to have live text turn on. Remember, live text is a phone number, an address, a URL, and for an action to show next to it. You can turn that on and off. By default, you're going to want to give it to the user. Now let's talk about the one below. This is important. Show the My Widgets panel in the sidebar. This is an important one. This is a way for you to cheat the system a little bit, meaning I can give you widgets that act upon text or call plugins, but never show you the My Widgets panel. So you'll never be able to drag and add your own, first of all. But I can actually force you to take a category from the catalog, install those widgets that then call plugins. Voila. I could hide it and force you to do things. That's the best way a user should be, right? I don't want you to do anything extra, but force you. But for some of you, you may want them to interact with the widget on the side, which we said we'd go back in a minute and look at live one. This gives you the best of both worlds. You can blend this how you want. You can hide it. You can unhide it later. Whatever you want to do. Um, you can restrict you know, the provider IDs, whatever you want, all that fun stuff. You can restrict the extension points, anything you want to do. Now, you also can let the user 
manage a little bit about the actions themselves. Because inside of widgets, you can build actions. Like I said, it's a dev session. But the granular control inside of widgets is much, much finer than plugins. Plugins and features, you get whatever the feature does. Off you go. Once it's installed, off you go. Now, if it calls a web source or whatever, that's authentication. That's different. But you give them the feature. Widgets, you can actually turn on and off certain parts inside of it. Right? Moving down, I can allow users to send them via email to each other, install them via email or from the web, install them from the catalog, publish to the catalog, granular control. What this gives you is the ability for users to be part of the growing environment. So if they go out to iGoogle and create a widget off of Frogger, which works, or Asteroids, Carl had that, you can actually then make a widget that then lets you play Asteroids in your sidebar. Now that is an idea where they're creating their own, and then they're able to email or share it, mm, could be a problem. So there has to be some boundaries and settings to the users of exactly what, they're, what they understand their roles and rights are in this environment as they roll it out. But you're able to let certain users publish the catalog and then share it to others. So here's something I told you about earlier that I showed you when I clicked one of the widgets earlier. A widget can contain login information. How that's done is it pops up a web form. It asks you for a username and password. As soon as you do that, it creates an account document, encrypts the password, stores in your local address book. But let's say I have the right to email this widget to other people. It'll only reference there should be an account document. It will not send their proprietary information. So it will not send their username or password. It'll go to the next user. It'll look at their local address book for an account that matches this. And if not, it'll create it on the fly, and it'll prompt for a username and password. So you're able to send web form type authenticated widgets via email, in the catalog, whatever you want to do for deployment without concern of it's storing or using the username and password that's used in that local address book. Now, in saying that, I will also say this. If you're using a roaming or multi-user setup, then you have separate address books. No problem. If, however, you are using a single address book on a single machine that shares that all shares the same account information, that could be a problem, right? Because it's a hash encryption. I don't believe it's using a notes ID encryption on that field. So the widget may be able to see that information. That's not been confirmed or denied by Lotus, but I'm telling you, if you have a shared address book locally and users are using location documents to switch IDs, I'd be very careful with using stored web form username and passwords. I haven't fully got this answered or tested yet myself. So I'm just giving you the idea that it's there. Okay. So let's talk about deployment. We're doing great on time. We're actually right on time. We'll talk about deployment, then we'll go back over to the live stuff. This is what a site actually is. So for a plugin, remember I said it gives you a URL. The URL will end in site XML. A site XML will tell the client what feature, what number for that feature, and what plugins go underneath it. So you have a hierarchy. I gave it to you early on and started building on it. Plugins, loose parts you can reuse. Feature, the definable set that takes those plugins and makes it part of the client. A site XML says, go get me those features and pull those updates to me. A widget can point to a site on the back end and grab the plugin. Certain ones do that. Right? Tungle, the third-party provider, is a key example of that. Tungle actually installs a widget, but then it calls a plugin from that widget and goes out to the web and installs it. So you actually have a security thing there, and we're going to talk about that now in the security and deployment section here again. Is it's going out to the web, grabbing pieces from the web, and bringing it back inside of your environment. I don't want that. Okay, we need to talk about packaging in just a second. I want to control every step of this process. So if you're a developer on the call, we're going to talk a little bit about how you should package stuff. If you're an administrator, I'm going to tell you how to look at these developers of how they should be packaging stuff. Right? Security is a big part of this because we're opening up more pieces of the environment we've ever done. We're going beyond the NSF. That's, a, that's like a good game show name. We're going beyond the NSF, and we're moving into the realm of pulling in web data, or letting web access my data because it's using my notes ID. So you have to be careful of who signed it, where it's going, and how it's accessing. Keep that in mind. So here's a site XML. It's telling me where the features members are, what the feature names are, as well as what 
plugins it calls. What's inside a site file? Now, the cool part about this is, is in a minute, you don't have to learn any of this. But as an administrator, you should understand it. And as a developer, you should know it. Because to build these parts, you have to know these key things. The site itself just defines what the site is. But the tags underneath give the descriptions and URLs for more information and where the feature is and what feature areas. Why this is important is, for an administrator, I want these areas to be here because it speeds searching and performance. If it had to scan through everything and didn't have version numbers, it would take all day. So the feature, as a developer, says, here's the current release. As an administrator, it says, my users are going to quickly find that current release. So they work together. There's actually nine sub areas. You can find them all documented well. It's all part of the Eclipse framework stuff. But the idea is the version, and then the final one is the URL of where to go to get the update. That's a key thing. That's why I have it at the bottom for us to focus on. That URL should be inside your environment. You shouldn't have users going to the internet to get updates for plugins if you do not control that internet site. Because what if there's a version incompatibility and they all dynamically update? Right? What if there's a bug in the code and it crashes all your clients? Or worse yet, what if there's some sort of malware in this code and it actually is taking data and it's updating from somewhere else on the net? That URL is very important because that's where it goes to update this information. You can control that URL as long as you can control all the pieces of the feature. So all the loose plugin files that build the feature. So where is a site update specified if I just want to do plugins? Inside the notes client, I showed you where it was in the same time. Inside the notes client, it's in the wrong place. Right? If IBMers on the call, they've heard me say this publicly. I've said it at Lotusphere. I've said it at Admin. I've said it all over the place. This is in the wrong place. It should be in a policy. Instead, it's in the configuration settings for a server. My users do not see configuration settings for a server. I should be able to specify by policy where your update site is. So to get around it, and I still, we, we debate about this. Right? We debate about this. They, Lotus says, well, no, we built it this way. And I say this is the only thing that, to me, doesn't make sense. They built a widget action to call a plugin that then goes to a URL. Well, if I don't want my users to have widgets at all, and I don't want to use widgets, I just want to use plugins, then I should be able to build a site update that just gives them features. I can't do that, because users never see this configuration document. Even though it's built in there under client upgrade provisioning, what sites do I go to, and do I include them when updating features and allow clients to update from these sites. It's built into the wrong place. So in essence, this really, this field and this function inside of the server configuration documents doesn't give you a lot of benefit right now when we're talking about just installing features and widgets and things like that. Later on, when you talk about full provisioning and client provisioning, when they get into that, this will become very useful. But if I don't want to give my users widgets and just plugins, I really can't. I have to give them a widget that calls the feature and the plugin to be installed is the way they, they're doing it now. And that's the way all these vendors are writing them. So you're getting sometimes features slash plugins when you think you're just getting a widget. Okay. I feel better now. Does everyone hear that? I've, now that I've let that out to you, I feel a little bit better. So here's the beauty of the whole thing. Lotus has actually done a beautiful job on most of this. They built an update site database. It's a free template. It comes with your server. And all you need to do is create the database from the template. And then you'll start pointing to it. It has a built-in rendered site XML. So for anything you need to do, you can upload, if you look, all your features. It'll store the numbers. It'll break down the plugins, everything around it, inside of this database. Then you point to this database, which has a native site XML output. So it'll be server name slash database name slash site.xml. So I'm able to, on the fly, build an update site from a notes database. And to do it, I just upload all the features I want. So if you notice the action menus across the top, I can import a local update site. I can import a single feature, which then will pull in all the plugins underneath it. Right? I can merge from another database, meaning I can take an update site from your company or from a vendor and merge it into mine. And then the last one is the most important button of them all. 
I can update the URL reference to point to my server. So if I buy plugins from you, features, I'm able to click this button after I import it into my update site and actually change the URL reference to my server. So at that point, I control my users. I know where they're getting the update from. I know the version number. I know the name of the files. I know the feature name itself. I can see all the pieces. I can see who provided it on the left in the views. I can see the plug-in pieces underneath. If there's any loose fragments, I can see those. I can see the whole thing. This is a beautiful piece of technology. And this is how you actually are able to do both. And here's, here's the best part, guys. Same time and Lotus Notes. This database is an Eclipse update site. I'm able to import updates for both. So I can control all my updates from this catalog. If you have not done an update site yet, you need to do an update site. You really need to. You need to build this and build your widget catalog both. Now, the catalog, I'm going to give you a head start in a few minutes. But you need to do both. Now, the update site itself, I mean, sure, we've got one that has a few things in it that we pull, we control, we get from partners and customers. But a lot of this may be a, a product that we actually purchase. So what's cool about this update site, besides it gives you a native site XML on the fly, well, ACLs apply. So I can restrict users by notes ACL. If I don't know you, you don't get in. Now you're saying, well, how does that work for the web? Eh, it really doesn't. I'm going to show you how it works, though, with notes. This is the cool part stuff coming up in a minute. It has reader fields, so I could block you from certain parts granular or the whole thing, and I can replicate and make a global infrastructure, meaning I can set different users in different parts of the world to go to the same replica but on different servers. So I can scale this. I can move, you know, make a replica in four or five places across the world and then have them point to different locations to update so I'm not trying to draw from one central location. Or I can centralize the whole thing because it's not that huge and just have people update from one location. Either way you want to do it. I like the central location theory, maybe at a cluster with a web URL that's balanced, because then it gives you the ability to really centralize and sign it one time with a URL reference. If I have multiple replicas, then I'm going to have to have multiple URL references across the world, if that makes sense. That's one of the biggest parts. Now, what you can do that's kind of left out in just a minute is update nodes clients and same time clients differently, and I have a diagram for you. The other benefit I forgot is versioning controls, where I talked about pointing external hosts as versioning controls. If you don't wish to deploy an update to a plugin because it hasn't been tested, you don't have to because you control your own update site. If a user is pointing to an external host somewhere, you've lost that control. The user is then able to jump out and go anywhere on the web that they want to go, and you don't have control anymore. So by using the update site database and clicking the button to point them to your URL, you control when things get deployed. Right? Otherwise, the users are just loosely firing out there everywhere they want to go. So here's the difference between the two. A standard client, like same time, I, I don't want to use the word standard because then people confuse that with notes. A web-based update type client, an Eclipse type like same time, will use HTTP. Now, it can go to a Domino 8 or 7 server because it's just an NSF. It's just a web URL. So you can run an update site database on a 7 server for web updating only for same time. The cool part about this is if this is a notes client and it's an 8 server, instead of using the update site URL, notes can use NRPC. So it can use encrypted compressed traffic if it needed to to actually update itself using this database. It can use NRPC updates. That's a beautiful thing. So if you're only installing Notes features and you have an eight server and these eight clients everywhere and you just want to give features to the Notes clients, you're not worried about same time itself. Because remember, same time in Notes is not, it's, well, we'll get to that. Same time in Notes is not what you think. You can actually use NRPC for all the updates. So the links they use can all be NRPC. Now, I just made mention to it and I wanted to finish my thought. Same time inside of Notes, same time will never really get a plug-in like it would as it was a standalone Connect client. Anything you deploy that works with same time normally will go as another shelf application inside of Notes, another feature. It won't be in same time. It'll be inside of Notes, but it'll be a separate part. It may interact, but it doesn't install into the Connect client like it does on the outside. 
The Plantronics one does. It's one of the few that does because it has call control for the VoIP stuff. So keep that in mind. But you, if you have an 8 client with an 8 server, you can use native NRPC traffic for an update site database. That same database can then serve site updates for web-based clients like Same Time Connect over HTTP. Okay? So you're a developer. You guys are really quiet with the questions today. I'm very impressed. You're a developer. What do I want to do? Well, I'm going to write it, and I'm going to create an update site and put my own stuff in that update site and give people that database. I could host my own. Right? I could put my own update site database together and tell customers to point there. A few smaller customers may, a few people trialing it. That's a great way to do free or trial. That is not the way to deploy for enterprise. I've given you guys a way out early. If you are deploying a plug-in for enterprise purchase, and they've attended one of my webinars, they are not going to want to point to your update site. That's just the way it is. I'm teaching them not to, only because of security concerns as well as versioning control. Because if you accidentally deploy a bad version and all my clients go online and then grab that version, you screw up my environment and it's my fault. I shouldn't let them do that. So when you come to me as a vendor and you've written an awesome feature right, that, go, that calls plugins, because I mean, here's a cool thing we didn't talk about because it's not a dev session. As a developer, if the pieces of plugins already exist in the notes client, you do not have to repackage them in your feature. You just point to them. So when I buy it, I'm buying a much smaller feature set because I already have the plug-in parts I need, maybe, you know, the com.ibm real-time stuff. I'm not a developer. I just know what pieces are already there. I already have that. You don't need to give it to me again. You just need to point to it, right? You just need to give me the new stuff that you wrote and tell me to point to the other stuff. So give me, a, give me an update site database that I use the merge function I just showed you a minute ago, right? Go back up. Right there at the top, number three, I give you the merge function. So you're going to give me your own update site database with your cool stuff. I'm going to say click, merge, point to it, and bring it in. I have now brought in your stuff. I'm going to point it to my URL. It's going to point to pieces of plugins that already exist on the clients to provide a faster load time for the users to install. And I've now deployed the feature as an ISV in a safe, secure way. Right? So you can ship this database to them. Like I said, you could let them point to you. or you ship me a zip file. And this zip file will contain the feature. It will contain the plugins I need extra as well as references to them. So I'm able then to grab just this zip file and import, oh, you know, I have to ex you know, expand it first, of course, locally. Then import that into my database. Either way, I'm in control and you're giving me ways to get it. So your delivery mechanism, as cool as it is to run your own update site database, won't work for most enterprises because they shouldn't be doing it. If they let their users do it, that's their fault. And they're trusting you, you know, wholeheartedly. They're also trusting your digital signature. They're also trusting your update plans. They're also trusting your versioning control as well as your testing of their client versions they have. It's a whole mix of things. But to be a proper ISV to do this, to give you deployable, I prefer you use an update site database that I can import and make that an option, or here, just download the zip of this feature set and then install that into your own update site. And if they don't know what the heck an update site is or how to use it, have them come see me or watch this webcast when the replay goes online. That's the whole idea. So we'll go back to live stuff and Q&A in just two seconds. Here's what I've given you. So the catalog I showed you, is available. Um, I worked with Gab over at Turtle a few years ago. Uh, actually, it's been two or three years now, and we put it up. So you have the two choices. You could go to lotusphere.turtleweb.com and actually see the catalog via the web and drag and drop from the web. And we'll go over and we'll drag and drop and play in a second. Or it's a public note server. So you can actually just create a connection document to, and it's called Tranquility, to uh, to Turtle public, but you can just create a connection document to lotusphere.turtleweb.com and actually browse that server. It'll create an instant on-the-fly cross certificate for you and grab that catalog or just browse it. What I've done is replicated it. So I've got a copy of it so then I can take plugins or add to it, do things like that. OpenNTF has their own catalog, but notice the end is an HTML file. The problem with that is it's web-based only. It's not notes-based. I can only drag and drop into my client 
if I have the rights to do so. And as an administrator, you should, but your users don't. That catalog really doesn't work the way we want it to. Right? We want a notes database that I can open up and drag and do stuff and add stuff and do stuff. There's a Lotus page for managers that teaches them what widgets are with like three or four easy screenshots and plugins are. So you can show it to your managers and say, this is what we want to do if you have to get approval. And if you want to create widgets, um, separate webcasts coming on wid widget creation, but there's actually a Notes 8 widget cool document of the basics of how to do it. That's right there. All right. So before we go to the live to keep us on time, things to remember, easy. Security first. The utmost thing that we're going to do on this is security. You're going to make sure that they're signed properly, you trust the signature, the URL points to somewhere you know. I'm going to build a widget catalog and put some required widgets in it, and then maybe force a category for users, but also put some fun ones in there too at first, something that won't waste a lot of time, but gives them an idea of the capabilities. As an administrator, um, there's one for Lotus Support that you can search Lotus Support that's out there. So if I highlight any text in any email I get from a user, from a customer, from a client, whatever, I can right-click as I showed you and search Lotus Support based upon those words. I don't have to go and type. and look. I can just, just highlight, right-click, go and it's off there. Same time, plugins are not controlled in the domino directory. They're controlled in the policy documents I showed you inside of the web interface. So plugins for same time are controlled via site update. The site update can be a domino database, but the policy control sits in the same time administration, not inside of domino administration. That falls into play for widgets. All right, and then go ahead and use the security around your update site because that's what it's built for. I mean, the whole point of having it is to be built for that. So what I've also done is, like I said, create a blog post that I'm about 70% done. I'm going to add a couple more to it, giving you, I'll put some of these links, but as well as the top, top 10 that I use daily inside of it. So what I can do is go over and show you some more live ones real quick or answer questions. Let me see if there's any in there. Well, of course there is. Hold, oh, please. Let me float it so I can see it. Sorry, guys, I didn't know there was more questions in there. Usually I go through and see them, but for some reason it wasn't flashing to me. All right. Yes, it's being recorded so you can watch it. The difference between a widget catalog and a mashup catalog, do we care? Not really in the sense that a mashup catalog will control other features for the client themselves, and it's usually composite apps is usually what they're talking about. You're going to be forcing them in a different way. It's not going to be the same. Do we care? I haven't seen anybody actually look for a mashup catalog. Now, if they're considering a feature, a mashup, then yeah, that would be, you know, would be true. Um, someone asked an off-topic, is the Lotus Knowledge Base Notes client publicly available? No, it's not publicly available. Uh, scroll down. Is there a difference between toolbox and update site.nsf? All right, this is a this is an interesting one. Um, these are just database names. So he asks, I don't know if it's he, sorry, they ask, is there a difference between toolbox.nsf and update site.nsf? They are only database names. They're NSF names, they can be whatever you want. Now, in terms of the way I have them, toolbox is our widget catalog. Update site is the update site for XML. I keep the naming that way just because then I know the difference. You could call it widget tools, widget box, widget catalog.nsf, and update site, whatever you want. It's an NSF that renders a catalog and an NSF that renders a site XML. You can call them whatever you want on a file structure. The file name doesn't really matter. For consistency sake, I would hope that you pick one. All right. How do you sign the plugins once you get them? Good question. You can update the signature of, I'm sorry, let me word this properly. You can update the site from which they update, meaning you can tell the URL they need to go to to pull down their new feature sets. But digitally signing them, you'd have to actually open and recompile and sign them. So you'd actually have to reopen and re-sign everything. Um, in the dev session, we'll talk about digital signatures a little bit more. Um, oh, thank you. Someone complimented said they're listening very, 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 very carefully. <laughs> I mean, it's the best widget plugin discussion they've heard for a while. That's great. I appreciate it, guys. Um, another one. Oh, a long one. Hey, oh, geez. Regarding updates to plugins you've already installed, were you saying the client won't even check for updates unless you add the update site URL to that server thing, 
or is it supposed to check the sites you've already used in addition to the update site? Great question. Okay. If you've installed a widget that calls a feature and it has an update URL on the web, it will search that update URL. The client naturally will search any update URL on a scheduled basis. Okay. The catalog will replicate locally to clients for widgets, by the way, and it does it on low priority, so it's a once every 24 hour thing. So if you're deploying widgets faster than that, users aren't going to get them by default faster than a day. I left that out and I apologize. Now, for the question, the client will check that URL that's built into the feature itself. The update site that we're talking about that you specify would contain new things they should install based upon security models as well as updates for those. So it kind of checks both. But if you point to the same place inside that, it'll always go there, if that makes sense. I mean, if you tell your plugin to go there, it will always update from that same location. If I'm in, pulling from Tungle, for example, my one widget that calls the plugin says go out to Tungle and look for updates, while GIST says go to GIST and look for updates, while our internal one says go there and get the Weather Buddy update. So there's all sorts of ones that go around. Um, but it will look naturally to whatever's inside the plugin as well as your home URL that you've set. Can you have one widget catalog defined in the notes catalog preferences? Yeah, you only have one. Um, definitely, definitely one is all you're going to have catalog, and you'll let the users pull from that. Now, you could have different users pull from different catalogs based upon policy settings, but you're only going to have one catalog for that. For update sites, you can actually start layering in some different ways across that. You could have a couple different update sites, but you're definitely only going to have one catalog. Uh, yes, there will be a dev session on building, on building those. That's a definite right there. And uh, let me scroll down. Anything else? Oh, there's a thank you in there. No, you're very very welcome. There's a lot of information, and one of my problems with this is having to skip around a little bit um, between the two, and I've tried to make it a, a flow. Uh, another one popped in. Is a server restart required to implement an update site DB? No. A server restart to implement an update site DB. Oh, okay. So I'm creating a new, I understand the question. I'm creating a new update site database. If I've never put it in a policy, then I can put it in the policy, resave the policy, and the client will pull on a regular basis and do it. So no. The same applies for the catalog. Now, because it's a server config for the update site, yes, for that part there would be. So let me explain what I just said, because I know I, my mind, I work, guys. Most of you already know this. This is how I work. Yes, if I'm doing a widget catalog that goes to a policy, no, I don't need a server restart. I need to specify the catalog. I can add any widgets I want on the fly. If I'm adding an update site, I can put it out there and reference it via those widgets at any time, and there are no restarts necessary to the client or the server. If I'm going to list new update sites in the server configuration document that no one really sees properly, then yes. The only time that's read, I think, is on startup. It's because it's not part of router. It's not part of anything else. My guess would be for that it would be a restart because I don't know of any way to refresh that part of the document for being seen by the server. Okay. Uh, catalog and update site, are they the same database? No. The update site kind of is a catalog of features and plugins, but it's not a true catalog. It tells the client what it's allowed to get. A catalog for the widget is a whole separate database, separate forms and views that have XML. So I can flip over and we'll take a look at that um, and kind of explain a little bit more of the difference. And oh, here's a good one. Oh, yes, you're welcome for the recordings. Yeah, I always record it. I know it's a very difficult uh, stuff, mainly language translation. Um, someone removed a widget, but the notes client is still looking at the catalog for that widget for updates. Well, have you defined a forced catalog either in your client preferences locally. Well, let's just switch. All right. So let's switch back. Let me move this real quick. Now, if you've got more questions for a second, hold on. Let me move stuff real quick. There we go. And I'll move this back over for everybody. All right. So inside of your client, are you guys seeing my screen? Probably not. It doesn't look like you're seeing my screen, are you? I think you were seeing my screen, but I was actually looking at the wrong window myself on the viewer, so I wasn't seeing my own screen. Eh, sorry about that. 
There we go. <laughs> I apologize. Thank you for answering that you guys see the screen, though. I appreciate it. I was looking at the wrong window on mine. Inside of your preferences, you have a widget preference area, and you're going to tell it where to go. Notice we call ours widget catalog. You're going to tell it where to go, and it sees all the categories. If you've left it here inside of this, then your client will always look to find these. Or the other part is if in the website, so we'll go ahead and say, okay, in the website and the policies that I showed you, if you have a widget force there, it'll still look there. So they're trying to force, it looks like it's trying to force you the widget, or you've left a remnant inside of yours. So inside the widgets, you can always get rid of them by right-clicking and removing, and it should get rid of everything. All right. Notice, here's another key thing, and we were talking about this. I have the ability to email. One interesting thing about when you send widgets via email is they always have the same extension. And it doesn't tell you the name of it. So it gives it, well, it says the word trip it now. It used to say the extension. And then you can send it who you want. So this is if that user is able then to drag and drop and take this back to their own, their own client, then they could. Okay. So that's one way to do it. So that's emailing them right there. Now that's different. So the widget catalog, which we've got, right, I could have opened it right there. It probably made more sense, wouldn't it? Probably would have made much more sense. Let me see. Widget catalog. As you see, I replicate this one directly from the web, from Turtle, so I get all the widgets everyone puts out there in the world. I get it. So that's one of the big things. I see another question coming in, so hang on. So I get all of them. So I get everything that everyone's put out there and I can grab and I, we let you know, people play around with um, all the different stuff, right? This one's even cool. It has notes, themes to change your colors, stuff like that. But we give the ability for the users to go get whatever they want to get from out here. And you can see some of these have been around for over two years now, but no one ever goes and accesses these. So what's different about that is the update site. It's totally separate. This is just widgets only. Uh, someone asked how you get this. This is the last slide I showed you. This is on lotusphere.turtleweb.com, HTTP lotusphere.turtleweb.com. This database is publicly available via notes or via the web. You can get it either way. So all these are out there. Please add to it, most definitely. Okay. One other question came in. I want to make sure because it's a big one. Uh, we upgraded to 8.5. We disabled the Show My Widget sidebar by policy. Now we want to enable it and have it set to yes. In the client preferences, we have clicked Show My Widgets, but can I get the widgets to show? Um, I'm presuming that you did turn it back on in the policy for the users. And I'll show the update site. You did show it in the users, um, but it's not showing up on the client. I would clear the policy entirely and clear the setting once. Let the client refresh from the policy so you have to wait a few hours and then try to reset. Otherwise, it could be a bug in there somewhere. What I want to show you guys is go to the web. There's a huge knowledge collection for widgets and live text. I know it was for 801, but there's a huge knowledge collection. It's 7011861. 7011861. This has a huge knowledge collection of everything you want to know about a lot of the stuff um, about widgets built into it, and they link to other ones. Okay, um, some good basics. We can see is there a way to remove the widget from showing its own panel? So I think there there may be something out there for you already to answer that. I've never seen it yet that you couldn't get it to show back up. Um, oh, and then the update site. Uh, let me find you, I think. If not, I know it's on my desktop. There it is, update site. So let's compare the two, the catalog and the update site. Sorry, it's opening. So there's the update site. This is the live one. Notice, I'm going to show you, we'll walk through real quick. Notice the difference. Widget catalog, right, has the widgets by author, what they are by category, but the update site, sorry, I had to move it over so I could see the whole screen. The update site lets you see much more. I can see if there's any categories. I can see the different features. It still shows version number. I can see the plugins that are underneath and the version numbers that fit in them. Right? I can see any loose fragments that are out there, which are none, and then the entire packages that are referenced. Right? So Pilio is using a VNC package. Tungle has a toolbar package because they install up to my toolbar at the top up here, and then they install in the background. Um, the connector itself, there's a huge difference between the two um, and what they do and what you can see. And then the cool part is, like I said, I can say, oh, I want to import the features.
So it's going to say, where is the site for this feature or the jar files loosely? Where do you want to go? Tell me where they are, and I'll go get them. So I can actually import those loose ones and then update the references inside of them. That's what's so cool about this whole thing is that I'm able to control everything that's out there now and actually update it to myself. Okay. Where are we? We're right on time. Uh, it's 11.15. So we have to go back and say where it was brought to you. Remember, everybody, this was brought by Plantronics. Um, get the plugin. It's free. Uh, bit.ly slash I do Plantronics 2. You can see the UC announcement and actually get the plugin. If you're going to play around with same time voice control, it has the call control built in. If not, you know, you don't have to use it at all because voice control still works. It just interacts with the headset. I showed two of the headsets that I know I'm using every day only because these, this is rock and I'm talking to you on the one. Uh, what else do we need to know? More webcasts next week. If any of your companies, customers, or partners, please tell them to attend that one only because it's a very cool session. It's on eDiscovery. Uh, Bill Michelski, and it's a great session on e-discovery inside of it. That is next week. And I don't know if there's anything else. This will be online. This will be recorded. And otherwise, uh, make sure you subscribe for the upcoming ones. We have a few more uh, surprise ones here coming up in the next few weeks that we want to get out the door. Thanks, everybody. Oh, wait. Someone said, uh-oh, lotusphere.turtleweb doesn't work. Hold on. Someone just caught me off guard. Two seconds, guys. You weren't supposed to tell me something didn't work because it worked earlier. Lotus. Here, dot turtleweb.com. Someone said lotusphere.turtleweb.com isn't working anymore. If it's not, the server's called Tranquility and it used that URL. I'm wondering if something's down. I'll ping and ask. It's always been up. I'll ask Gab real quick and I'll, I'll find out for you. But it did was working before. It says connecting to. The server may just be down right this minute because they use it every Lotusphere also for the Lotusphere database that you load on your BlackBerry and stuff. So it's all the same server, so it may just be having a problem right now over there. All right, everybody. We're on time. We're out of here. If you have any questions, please email me, send a note. Otherwise, look for this online and for the next one in the series.